We are Christina, Oneida, Alicia, Colleen. Welcome to 4NP's podcast. This is a podcast by 4NP's, 4NP's advanced practice nurses, students, and anyone interested in the medical arts. That's the number 4NP's podcast. If you have a topic you'd like to see covered, please feel free to email us at 4NP's podcast at gmail.com or reach out to us through our social media. This week, we're going to talk about what you can do once you obtain your degree and how you can go about approaching the job market. So what can you do with this degree? We asked ourselves the same question. And some of the thoughts that came to our mind were, um, how can we figure that out? Where actually do we see ourselves or where do you see yourself? And what kind of specialized area or job role as an NP do you see yourself? What are your concerns? What are your apprehensions? What's the job market like? How do you even figure that out by networking, different social media platforms? Um, So we kind of want to touch base on a few of those topics and ideas and put our, our thoughts into play here. I was kind of researching this and um, looking at different uh, choices for NP degrees, in addition to like, you know, working in an office, there's also working in a hospital as a hospitalist. And in addition to that, when I was researching this, I found that there were a lot of different um, opportunities, including like uh, being a clinical editor, where you develop and maintain proprietary information, clinical content, also uh, clinically appraise um, the work of others. Um, And then uh, Colleen, uh, what do you do as a nurse practitioner? Right now, I'm a research nurse practitioner. Um, And so I go to people's homes who are in clinical trial for the company that I work for. And I Really, um, it's it's more like a nursing role. It doesn't feel like a nurse practitioner, but I go in and I take samples. So blood samples, nasal samples, swabs, you name it. I do vital signs. I review medications. And then there's also telehealth as another part of it, which I haven't started doing yet, but I um, will be learning in the future. And uh, so that's another option for nurse practitioners, uh, especially in this day and age. That's that's awesome. That's very interesting. How did you find out about that position? So my background is in research as a as an RN. When I was looking for nurse practitioner positions, I saw a lot of jobs that I kind of tried to picture myself in and I couldn't. Uh, specialty positions. There was one or two along the way that I thought would be interesting to me, but some of them, you know, I didn't feel like I had a lot of clinical experience in. It would be a really big bridge to focus in on some of the specialties that I saw available. There were some primary care positions, which I did apply for, but I didn't get, they didn't feel that I had enough clinical background. I, so I started, I discovered that there were nurse practitioner positions for research. So I just started following them. So I used like LinkedIn and Monster and um, I'm trying to think of some of the other boards I use. A lot of the, the employment boards and I, you can set up your preferences for what kind of jobs you want to see come through. And so I would see jobs for nurse practitioners in research come through. And that's how I found the job that I I have doing that. And that's just a per diem job. But uh, that works for me. I need I needed that flexibility. Do you have to travel for the job? For this job, I travel. Yep. But I get paid for mileage. And I get paid for the visit and documentation time. So it works out okay. I I can choose how far I want to travel. I can say I only want to stay for the company. This is for the company that I work for. They allow me to say to them, I don't want to work, you know, outside a 60 mile radius, or I don't want to work outside a 20 mile radius, but that would limit the number of patients I can have. So I, uh, I actually, I live in New York, so I, I, I'll I'll travel anywhere in New York. Wow. I like it. It's different, you know? Yeah. It sounds interesting. I like the fact that you can travel. That's, uh, I like that aspect of it. One choice that I saw as far as um, nurse practitioner careers or uh, career working and um, writing for uh, continuing education, which I had never even thought about. I thought that was really cool. You know how you do the CMEs or the CEs? That's actually a position that you can have as a nurse practitioner. That's awesome. There's also education consultants. 
and you can be hired either privately or by a university and they provide expert advice um, on navigating the field of course of nursing. And then also, of course, like we know all of our educators at school, you can be a, either a DNP or a, um, a PhD. Um, although is it just DNP to be a, or is there a PhD to be a, um, be faculty? I think there is a PhD also. Mm -hmm. I think you're right with that. Also, even if um, you are working in any other capacity, you can always teach adjunct. There's always uh, adjunct positions in the nursing department, at least in the local schools around here. I haven't looked across the country, but there always seems to be. That's another another option. Another job that uh, you guys might not have heard of, but three of you know about because I talk to you about it a lot, but um, there's a job called a uh, either a community science liaison or a medical science liaison. It's typically in the pharmaceutical area. And what it is, it's, it is a, it's an educator and they do look for nurse practitioners and you would go out, uh, a lot of these pharmaceutical companies, they'll hire you, they'll give you a credit card, they'll give you a car. You're not on the sales team, you're on the clinical affairs team, but what they want you to do is um, go and speak to what they call uh, KOLs, they're, I forget what that stands for. It's like a key leader. So if you have a physician that is an expert in his or her field and they, the pharmaceutical company wants you to speak to these people, to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, meet with them and forge a relationship with them in order to collect medical knowledge and information about their products. So if you have a doctor that is using, I don't know, Simbacort, I'm going to just say that any drug, Simcor is just an example. Uh, that's because I take it. But uh, <laughs> so you have a doctor that's using Simbacor. He prescribes it a lot. He's an expert in his field. The clinical affairs department in the pharmaceutical companies they want to hire somebody who can speak on a medical level to the physician to collect information about this drug. Here's what I use this drug on label for. Here's what I use it off label for. Here's what I've read in the research. It's a lot. It is a kind of research related position. You do have to really read and understand studies and be able to have a discussion about that, but it's a great job. It pays very, very well. Lots and lots of perks. So and it's something really unusual that I never heard of. Somebody approached me on LinkedIn about it. And when she first approached me, I said, I never heard of this job. <laughs> what, what made you, you know, what made you reach out to me? And she said, oh, well, I see that you're, you're a nurse practitioner. I see that you have this research background and, and that I had some education in there. And I just never knew that existed. So I thought that was kind of cool. So it's community science liaison. You could look up science liaison on Google and on LinkedIn if that's something that you were interested in. Do you think that's something that has to be like a full time or do you think you could do it like on a per diem uh, basis? I've only seen, but I, you know, I haven't looked that much, but I've only really seen full time ones for that. But I imagine that there's a lot of flexibility in it because you are making your own schedule with these physicians. Like they tell you who, you know, we have, you have a region and then there's, I don't know, 142 key leaders in the region, and you would have to meet with a certain number of them to meet quotas and stuff like that. So I think there's a little, it's almost like it has a sales tinge on it, but it's not really sales. You're not selling anything there. You're collecting information on what they're already using. So kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was doing a job search, I used every avenue I could possibly find. And I uh, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I did pay for LinkedIn premium when I was very, not aggressively, <laughs> not assertively looking for a job when I was kind of in the, I need to get a job. Do you like so, that? I love LinkedIn. Yep. The premium, I didn't find it as useful as I would have liked it to be. But I, the one thing that I really liked about it was that it would say to you, it would come up with a job and then it would say to you, you're in the top 10 candidates or top 10% of candidates for this position. And the thing that I liked about that was that sometimes it brought up jobs that I would never have thought of, but it looked, it like scans my, my resume, my CV on LinkedIn. It scans my LinkedIn profile, I guess, and it picks out certain things. And so then it uses those to match you to a job. So 
I did find a couple of uh, different jobs that I don't know that I would have found on a straight search. Um, I also liked being able to see who was looking at my profile, which is another thing that you get with LinkedIn Premium. Is it worth the amount of money? I, I can't remember how much it was. It wasn't crazy, but it wasn't cheap either. But I just did it because I just wanted, I, I kind of went in like I'm going to be as open as I possibly can. And I don't really know what I'm looking for. So, and I did find a couple of things I, you know, when I was looking, remember, I really wanted that breast position at Vassar and I interviewed with them a couple of times and, and I was, then I said it was between those two jobs and I chose the other one and blah, blah, blah. And then the breast job never called me back. I reached out to them when that other job fell through and said, please, if, if you didn't hire somebody, I really would still like to be considered. Anyway, long story short, I'm looking the other day on LinkedIn and that job is posted again. So whoever took that job didn't last. That was from last August. They didn't last. A year. Wow. Like you said, everything for a reason, you know, uh, maybe that it just wasn't meant to be. Yeah. And you love what you're doing. So everything does happen for a reason. I use ZipRecruiter. Class door. When I was looking for a job between my first and second hematology positions, I did go to a recruiter. I don't think that came of anything. But my current job, I actually, I think a big thing that people don't do is you network. You know, you, you like what I did was I put out almost like a desperate plea on Facebook. You know, does anybody know of a GI position and, and um, this angel? who I used to work with at the hospital. She was like, oh, hold on a second. And then um, it just, it happened to be. So yeah, don't be afraid to, you know, put out your, your desperate pleas. Just kidding. Just put out your, you know, out on, you know, social media, <laughs> right? Uh, put out on social media what you're looking for because, you know, something might just fall into your lap. <laughs> That's great. That's how I got the job, uh, my contract job that I have. It's great. Because I did that on LinkedIn. So on LinkedIn, you can do it. You can put that you're open to work. And then they ha actually have like a canned message that you can send out. And it basically sends out to your entire network saying, I'm open to work. I'm looking for a job. But I ended up getting the connection to the company that I contract for um, through good. that. So yeah. it was great. Hmm. Oh, Nida, what did you do? I did indeed in Glassdoor and some of the jobs that are posted are actually from recruiters because these hospitals or organizations contract with recruiters too um, to put out their list of, you know, job opportunities. And so I did connect with recruiters, but honestly, that never really panned out for me. Me, my direct contact with the organization was how I got to my the job that I'm currently at. What do you like? What do you mean by that? So I, when I had applied to the organization that I'm with now, I like it was them posting, and then I responded. I replied to their post, and then they were the recruiter kind, you know, not the recruiter, but their HR department connected with me, and that's how that worked out. Oh, like a, a, I gotcha. Yeah, that's the other thing is yeah, go on the sites and right and apply for whatever is posted right yeah. because then it pulls you to the the direct organization and you apply directly with them right, right oh the other thing is just going to like if i know i want to work for uh you know nyack hospital i just go to nyack hospital's website like every single organization and practice has a has a website and most of I would say probably 99% of the time they have a careers or an employment tab and you just go right in and fill that out. And also just back to the, well, the, obviously the networking kind of works. <laughs> that seems to be a good theme here, but uh, just, um, I remember reaching out to nurse practitioners that I knew that I had met in my clinical rotations and, or that I knew over the years and just asked if anybody knew anything. And I did get a couple of leads that way, nothing that panned out, but you know, you got to try like every, every angle. What I was going to interject is also, if you're applying through those websites, indeed, the organization requires you anyway to apply through them directly anyway, you have to. Even if you've applied and submitted your application through Indeed, you have to, at some point, if you get hired by the organization, go through and reapply directly through their oh, site. Okay. So FYI. Alicia, you're in the middle, in the midst of all this right now. What's it, what's it like for you to, with the job search? 
job search for me because I relocated to another state. I'm in Colorado now. Um, so it started with my RN license. So I'm actually starting out with an RN position just to kind of get myself rooted and figure out where I want to go. I don't quite know where I'm going to find my niche yet. However, you know, like traditional roles, I kind of don't really appeal to me. So I am looking more on a holistic, integrative medicine, naturopathic medicine type of um, role. So I, I like because I'm just still getting settled and there's just still so much uh, to learn about that to really decide if that's the path I'm going to go. Like I have a lot of research to do on my own to figure that out. But right now, um, you know, I did just pass the board a couple of months ago. It still feels like weeks. Um, you know, I have time to kind of sort through that. I don't want to jump, you know, into anything and then, you know, just feel completely overwhelmed and, and just dump the whole career altogether. I think there's so much hesitation, I think, as a new grad um, and just coming out of the board is just on the responsibility and like the different roles of the nurse practitioner and just how how that transition looks like, because coming from an RN, you know, you're looking at orders and you're fulfilling those orders and you're completing them and, and, you know, seeing those out to, you know, a diff changing your role now, and you're now the provider. And now you have that responsibility and you have the follow-up and you have the diagnostic portion of it. And, you know, it's, it, it's overwhelming, just a little daunting, to be honest with you, thinking about that from here, just coming out of the gate so I'm going to take my time with it and just really find, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like I'll find my place at, at some point, but you know, I, I am going to start work. Actually, I'm in an urgent care, not too far from where I'm located. So, and I've been in urgent care for the past year. So I do like the urgent care setting. So I'll be doing that for a little while. And then, you know, perhaps there'll be an opportunity there for me to transition into a nurse practitioner role there. I've thought of that. Um, but I, I really do like want to stick to a focus on, you know, holistic and, you know, integrative medicine and things like that, just because I think, you know, just a lot of healing and a lot of nutritional aspects and just other alternative medicines are, are less or not as frequently explored, you know, as that can be. So that's kind of like a passion that I'm kind of growing in. But I just wanted to find out a little bit more about what Alicia, like, what you're starting a program, correct? Shortly, and what it's all about. Oh, my Bible college. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, part of my coming out to Colorado was uh, on a faith based journey. Um, I am starting a Bible college. So after finishing a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in nursing, for me, um, there's just a faith uh, element um, to how I want to continue practicing and how I want to you know, move forward in, you know, like, ultimately, I love to do like medical missions and, you know, provide care and do things around the world, you know, and for me being having such a strong faith based, you know, focus, I kind of wanted to learn more about that, go deeper into that. And so I did, uh, I am starting a Bible college program, which is part of the reason why I'm out here in Colorado. Um, and that's going to be starting in a couple of weeks. So I'm excited to see where that um, is going to lead me foundationally. And just, uh, you know, like for me, you know, there's just a, a huge part of my faith that guides and leads, you know, what I do, how I relate to people, how I want to, I said this already, but how I want to practice. So, you know, that at, at its core, that was just something like I felt very deeply and very personal about, you know, very... Um, keep saying that very, 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 <laughs> but I'm excited on this journey. I'm excited. I'm like, I can't wait to start classes and to, so I'm going to be in class Monday through Friday, eight to 12. And then I'm going to be working after that. So the job that I have in the urgent care kind of suits those hours really well, um, which is another reason why I'm holding back on going kind of like diving deep into, um, you know, starting as a nurse practitioner in practice, just because, you know, most of the roles I'm looking at are for full time, you know, so there's quite a demand, you know, there as far as starting out. And I, I would want to give my whole and complete attention to that. And I know I won't be able to right away um, while I'm in um, Bible college. So, you know, for me, the part time work suits me for the purpose of what I'm doing. And, you know, they were completely on board with that when I was hired. So they know what my hours are going to be. And, you know, it's kind of a win-win. <laughs> it's what they needed and what I needed. So 
That's awesome. I think, and then eventually, I think that you know, you can integrate both, right? So you're you're gonna be um, doing the Bible study, and then you can kind of integrate it um, with your nurse practitioner degree and do something that's fulfilling for you. I think that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Because even like I've been, I was talking to Colleen about this, just like nurse coaching and counseling. Because as nurses, that's totally what we do all the time. You know, and for me, again, coming from a faith-based perspective there, I think there's more people looking for that than maybe, maybe we know, but, um, yeah, I would definitely be integrating that into my practice and, you know, whether it's nurse counseling, coaching, um, you know, nutrition, from a nutritional aspect, from a medicinal aspect, from just overall healing in the body and from a spiritual aspect. So, you know, I'm excited about, you know, what, what this, what's going to unfold. Christina, what about you? You have a long journey already with being a nurse practitioner, and you've done a couple of of really different things. So I wasn't sure, again, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I went to NP school. I still wasn't sure by the end, even six whole years later, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But I knew that I wanted to continue with my education. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to eventually do or maybe even start off in um, acute care. So I had the opportunity. um, My friend was going to be starting in the ICU. I want to say this was, excuse me, around the time that I graduated. Um, Feels like forever ago, but it wasn't. So she was going to start in the ICU. And I was like, you know, I think it would be a really good opportunity if I would be able to do the same thing, go to the ICU. And um, because I know that you need that experience to be able to work in a hospital, like acute care setting. So I reached out to the manager in ICU. And I said, you know, are there any um, positions available? And there happened to be a position available. And um, so that kind of happened very quickly. And so I started in the ICU um, in October of 2019, which is right after I graduated in May 2019. And, um, I did that. And actually right after I, I feel like right after I got off of orientation was when COVID like kind of like hit. So, um, that was very interesting being in the ICU during, um, the whole beginning of COVID. So I had all that in addition to the fact that at the time I was looking for a nurse practitioner position, there weren't a lot of part-time positions available for nurse practitioners. So, There was one available and it happened to be in oncology hematology, which I had no background in at all. And had I really thought about it, I probably would have been like, maybe not, but um, I did it because I wanted the experience. Yeah. So I was in a new environment in ICU and starting a whole new, um, you know, whole new experience as a nurse practitioner, plus in a whole different, um, like I knew nothing about oncology or hematology. So, I mean, I knew the basics like, you know, CBC, CMP, I knew that stuff. But other than that, I didn't know anything. So it was all new to me. And I don't remember what the question was. (laughs) (laughs) Colleen, what was the question? (laughs) It was just, it was just like to share, like to share your experience. That happens to me all the time. So I'm glad. It's like, I'm glad. yeah, I was like, what was I talking about? Um, well, you said, you said that you did it um, part time, Christina, is that right? That first uh, oncology? I did, yeah. Job, that's like a topic that we might want to all, and Oneida, you probably know about this too. When you're looking for the jobs, there's not a lot of part time right. NP positions available. They most of most of the places want you to come on full time. Yes, and by full time they mean how many hours, Oneida? Extra, double time, triple yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, so I think that you know part of your consideration when you're getting close to graduating, I think it's important to kind of have an idea of where you'd want to kind of direct your path, whether it's primary care, specialty care no NP clinical care whatsoever, (laughs) or, uh, you know, so you have to kind of have an idea. And that may change once you get hit the job market and search, you know, because as you're searching for these jobs, whether it's through Indeed or um, Glassdoor, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know this existed, you know, or, you know, whether you go through a recruiter. Um, So there's so many opportunities out there. But you kind of want to have an idea of what experience you're looking for. Is it the clinical experience? Is it like you said, Colleen, research? Is it not having a direct patient care role? So I think that's an important part of knowing before you kind of 
hit the search market yeah. or the job market rather. For sure. Yeah. Cause you've got to know, like, I mean, Colleen, you're doing something where you've got that flexibility. You've got, it seems like you've got a great deal of autonomy, like, and it depends like based on your family and based on other, you know, things that you do in your life, because I mean, quite frankly, I don't want work to be my entire life. <laughs> so you want to have things that you also do outside of that. And, and so, yeah, you have to definitely, you know, you know, find that niche or niche. Is it niche or niche? Niche? Potato, potato. It's the niche. It's our niche. We're going to find our niche. Okay. I do remember when we were undergrads that one of the things that we all used to talk about was that a lot of the instructors that you met along the way, one of the things that seemed to impress, I think, all of us at the time, and t- you know, tell me if you disagree, but was that a lot of them had had these long careers with a million different jobs. They did a million different things. It was unusual to have one instructor that had, you know, a 30 year career in one area of nursing, like they frequently would talk about different things that they had done over the years. And I I think that's probably one of the best things about nursing is that there's so many options. There's so many places to go. You could be like Oneida said, clinical or non-clinical. You don't have to be clinical if you don't like that or you're over that. You don't have to do that. And If you are clinical, but you only like, maybe you like elderly people, or maybe you like kids, or, you know, maybe you just want to do adults, or you want to do women's health or men's health or whatever you want to do, there's always going to be something available to you that's, that could you, you could find interesting. And I think maybe knowing that about yourself going into the job search is a good way to approach it, approach it, to look at all different types of jobs and say to yourself, could I see myself doing that? Is that something that I would feel excited about or interested in? And if it isn't, keep going. There's plenty of other jobs out there. So I think with that being said, what I've seen is that you're going into a job for a full-time position, right? You're getting hired for a full-time position. But what I've seen is after many years of experience with other NPs that they re- they negotiate their hours. So even though I'm hired at a 40 hour work week, right? I'm probably doing, we talked about this 55 to 60 hours. There are NPs that negotiate their contract to be 32 hours, 36 hours, three days a week versus five days a week, because you'll find that it's too much, especially if you have a family, a young family, um, to do the 40 plus hours. So a lot of NPs, even in primary care, you'll see that they don't necessarily work five days a week. They, they work maybe three, but those three are like 12 hour shifts just to have those two days. And I don't say downtime because you're still kind of working, but you're giving yourself some ability to kind of just regroup for the, for the next day or for your next shift. So that's an option, too, to consider when you're negotiating. Yeah, that's excellent. I think that um, what you don't realize when you first graduate and you're getting your first job is that there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. You know, like I used to stay after um, when I was working in hematology, oncology, especially because I was so unfamiliar with the subject and just like study my patients because I didn't want to look like I didn't know what I was talking about. So just like, and like Oneida, you've talked about, um, you know, all the labs that you have to go through and all the phone calls that you have to make. And there's just so many things behind the scenes. So it's just, um, it's not just, you know, being in the exam room. There's like, that's probably half of it, right, Oneida? Oh my gosh, it's there's so much more. And that's what you don't realize or know. I mean, how could we know, right? We weren't, we're not told that, but we want this podcast to be an eye opener for those that are new going into practice so that you do know, so you are kind of prepared to some extent on what you're in for, so to speak, before you like get thrown to the wolves. Right. I mean, <laughs> they always talked about in nursing, right? Nurses eat their young. That's a terrible <laughs> thing they even can think, right? But in primary, in practice as an NP, I mean, it's almost the same thing because you just are so unprepared as to what to expect. And then you're like hit with this Dumped. like enormous yeah. responsibility aside from prescribing. That's like another realm, you know, in narcotics. Oh, my gosh. 
So, I mean, then you're hit with all the extra work that you have to be responsible for that you didn't realize was part of your daily routine, but it is. And that's why burnout is so prevalent. Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's crazy. Right. It's like the things, the things that they never told us. Right. I I think we're supposed to have an episode on that, right? What, what they didn't tell you in nursing school (laughs) at some point, (laughs) just because, yeah, you come out of it and you're like, yeah, like what in the world did I, did I sign up for this? Yeah. Cause it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I remember our own Ida Trish always used to talk about how, um, you know, the things with NPs aren't really talked about, like there's not a huge support system. And she was like such a huge advocate for nurse practitioners and just, you know, open communication and just like, you know, all that. And I, and I really want to have her on this podcast as well. But um, yeah, I don't think there's like a great support system for nurse practitioners. There's not, you know, somewhere you can go to learn everything about it before you get into it. And there's so many questions. So I, I'm hoping that we can be that for, you know, other people. Right. Like I was given a list of like questions to ask when you're negotiating a contract, but it really as much as I appreciated it, it really didn't encompass much. I think having a conversation like this, which will be part of our next episode about truly knowing what to ask and why you're asking it, right? Not just, okay, here's a question, ask it, but understanding the base for those questions and why we're asking them. Exactly. You know, I think it's truly important. The hours, your, your, what you're required to be responsible for, that's not part of a contract because it's not even discussed. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That list is like, you know, you could see a list on a piece of paper and ask the questions, but if you don't understand the questions, are you going to really understand the answers? Like, I don't know. I was what just I'm about asking. to say that. I was just about to say that. Like, right. I had yeah. clinical yeah. hours and then just I had right, getting the answer back and being like, okay. What I wanted to uh, refer to was you've got on your contract, it says, okay, here are your 40 clinical hours and here is your administrative hours. Those administrative hours are your down, is your downtime. I get one hour a week <laughs> in my contract. I mean, that's crazy, right? So you need to know how to negotiate that before you go into signing a contract. Those are the specifics we talk about. Yeah, but the other side of it is, why are you going to take advantage of us before we even start becoming a nurse practitioner? Like, I mean, how many other nurse practitioners have they gone through? You know, like, wh- why don't you just treat your nurse practitioners and like, not like, I don't understand, like, why that's even a thing? Like, well, how about you like actually give them what they need to- to be good nurse practitioners because obviously that we don't know what we're talking about um so that you can keep them and not keep having the turnover like doesn't that make sense it does but it's a business it It, it is a business but it's a business but they're putting all that money into educating us that's why but we allow it at the same time number i'm sorry but that's but at the same time as nurses we are not sticking up for ourselves like we're not knowing what we have a right to or what we can ask for and a lot of times we settle and we say oh okay this is the best i can get or and we're so happy to have like you know that employment or to get that job offer we think this is great but we don't know how much more we could have had if we had known how to ask for it or known what to ask for there should be a whole course maybe like you know on business negotiations like not just oh here's a list but but like, how do you actually do that? And what does it look like? Because I mean, eat like, like we were just saying, like you can get that answer, but really just not know how to process that. Like, okay, well, I asked the question now, what does that answer mean? And, you know, like one hour for your downtime or administrative time to you might've sounded like, oh, okay, I get an hour. How do you know that that's not going to be feasible, that that's not realistic, you know, that you end up doing 20 hours or needing, you know, to do all this other extra time that's, that you're not getting paid for. So I think like, but nurses in general, we are just like such caring and loving and giving people. And we, you know, we want to do a good job. And, and a lot of times we, we settle for things that are, are just, uh, that shouldn't be accepted, you know? So true. We're also coming in from just graduating in particular with, you know, a sense of, well, I just want to get my first job. I just want to get in there and I want to start working. And so when the contract comes to you, you could be an expert in contract negotiations, but when that contract is handed to you to review, you don't really yet know what that job actually entails. And so you're reading through a contract, but it 
it doesn't mean anything because you don't really know what that day to day is like. And then you get in the day day to day, and Oneida is a perfect example of this. You get in the day to day, and you go, "Hey, wait a second! This isn't what I signed up for. What is this? Why it? You you know that's not going to work." And and then when you would try to go back and renegotiate, you might have a hard time with that. So um, that is definitely something to to read up on, look into. We're going to discuss it here and. And, you know, even ask other nurse practitioners that, you know, um, their experience. I talked to a nurse practitioner recently who's been a nurse practitioner for, I guess, 10 or 12 years. And um, this person wants to leave their job. And they said, I can't leave my job because it's in my contract that I can't work anywhere within like a 30 mile radius of where I'm currently working. And the 30 mile radius encompasses all the hospital systems in the area because I'm near a small city and... And so they're stuck because she said, where would I go? Now I have to commute like well over an hour to go to a job when I could, there's a million places right here I could just apply for. But she said she feels kind of trapped. That's crazy. How how long, I mean, I don't know if you've asked all that, but like, okay, so she can't work within a 30 mile radius of where she's working. For how long does that like time, for what timeline if she resigns? That's yeah, it depends crazy. on the contract. Usually about a year or two. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think for her it was two years. But I yes, I have also heard a year, Christina. So that's a huge red flag if I ever see that. Well, it's it's in most contracts. Yes, it absolutely is. What's, in it called? Almost- what's, what's the wording? It's called uh, a non-competitive. Competitive, yeah. Non-competitive, right. There are options is what I'm saying, even though you're, com- you know, you're like, you hate where you're at especially also for nurse practitioners, there's still so many different job descriptions you can have, you know, not specifically whether it's specializing, whether it's, you know, there's just a lot of different options. So that makes it a little bit, gives you more flexibility when you're stuck like that into a clause. Mm. It would be nice if we could not have those clauses. though. <laughs> I don't see that going away. I could understand a, a, a corporation saying, we don't want you to hang your own tile. You know what I mean? We don't want you to open up your own practice. I can understand that because then theoretically you could be stealing their patients. And that's the whole reason for that clause is that they don't want you stealing the patients that you've established because if they hear, you know, I'm going to Oneida for my primary care and Oneida moved 10 miles down the street, I'm going to go 10 miles down the street when I go to see her next because that's that's, they're trying to make it difficult really for the patients to not. Right. (laughs) Ultimately, you know, they don't want to lose their, they don't want to lose their patients. Yeah, exactly. Do you think you would ever specialize? I think it's um, it's a good option if you are really enjoy, if you you really want your focus, your care focus to be in a general area, because even specialties, like I think about like endocrinology, they don't just, I mean, it's in the endocrine system, but that's a big system, right? So you still have to know a lot about diabetes, um, thyroid disorders, autoimmune conditions to an extent, just like rheumatology. It's a big focus still, you know, even though it's specialty, there's still a big system that you have to, you know, be knowledgeable in. Obviously, primary care is even bigger than that, but it's very broad. Yeah, They're all still pretty broad, I would say. Yeah. And I guess this, the different interactions of different conditions with whatever the system is that you're focused in on, but sometimes it's affecting. And since we're nurses and nurse practitioners, we're looking at that whole person. We're not looking at this small little piece of the puzzle. You know, we're always looking at what's the big picture here, what's going on with the whole body. And the hard part is they all overlap at some point, right? Yeah. Right. I was just going to say, Christina, you just started in GI. Has that been for you? Um, actually, that ties into what I was going to say also. So I was just going to say that once when you first graduate, you know, when you you get that first position or you're first applying and you get that first like callback or that first email saying, yeah, we want to bring you in. You're just so especially if it's a part time position and there's not many part time positions, you're just so like, oh, my gosh, I have to take this job because I don't know if another one is going to come in so that's another point to that which is why I went into hematology oncology and I did end up staying I think 14 months in hematology oncology but I think I think what nurse practitioners need to know is that there are a lot of jobs out there and I and not to be scared to kind of wait for something that 
is more most comfortable for you. Like you don't have to take the first, you know, interview that you get or the first job that you get and that you should really think about what if you want to go into a specialty, if you want to do primary care because I think that just being a new pr- nurse practitioner and learning that role and learning that whole collaboration with your physician and how that's going to work and how your relationships are going to work with the staff and everything that goes into that, that's a large enough new thing for you to be handling. You know, that's like, that is, it's a battle in itself, right? So just kind of take your time and, and figure out what you want to do. Had I like been patient and made sense, I would have gone into what I wanted to do, which was, is GI, which is where I am now. And I, and I, like the first practice I was in, I really enjoyed it. The, the doctors were great. The staff was great, but I just, I wanted to be closer for, to home. I was an hour away. So, um, after six months, I, I went to another hematology oncology practice, which was, uh, I was there for eight months and it was closer to my home, um, which was horrible. Like I hated it. Like, it just, I didn't have a good relationship with my provider. It just, it was a smaller practice. So, so I've learned that about myself. I want to be part of a larger practice. So again, I looked for another position and thank goodness I came into this position because I love it. I just love the, my, the doctors I work with. Um, it's just, it's just great. And it's such a great feeling to like, I look forward to going to work. I love it. Like, I think that that's so important. I don't know. And I don't know if it's because I'm a little more used to my role as a nurse practitioner, or had I had had this opportunity when I first graduated would, you know, would I have loved it as much? I don't know, because that, that wasn't my experience. But you know, yeah, I'm really, really, really loving my new role um, in GI. I, I just, it's, um, I'm so happy that I found a position that I just feels. That's amazing. Right. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Happy for you. You said something, Christina, that just, just stuck with me, which was, um, I can't remember exactly what, how you worded it, but it was basically saying like, you said, I learned that about myself. And I, I think, throughout all of this process, I think that's a really important point. And I think for anybody who's new, or if you're going to be graduating soon, you know, allow yourself to get to know yourself and what you like and what you don't like and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. And it's all okay. You have to be okay with that. And that that's something that I've always struggled with is like, I, you're, we're trained that we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to, sorry about the dog. <laughs> We're trained that we're supposed to go on this path. It was like when we were RN, we were trained to go into the hospital. Mm-hmm. Really, that's, I mean, I, that's my, my sense of it is that we were trained in right. Then, so when I, I did go into the hospital and I, it was very hard for me. And when I chose to leave it, I really, I had like almost a little bit of a breakdown. Like I was so afraid to leave that path because I thought in my mind, <sighs> geez, this is, I'm supposed to do that because that's what a nurse does. But the fact is, and somebody very wise said this to me, they said to me, it doesn't matter where you are a nurse. All that matters is that you are a nurse. And it really stuck with me. And I, I've always kind of carried that along my own path because there have been times for me where I have guilt or like, I feel like, oh, I'm a nurse, but I mean, I work in research. I mean, I did. I did have patients for 13 years that I was in research. And like I said, when I was going for jobs, they they were saying to me, well, you don't have clinical experience. And I'm thinking I probably have more clinical experience than some of the nurses that you're interviewing. It's just that you don't understand my clinical experience. I'm doing medication reviews. I'm doing head to toe physicals. I'm doing procedures on patients. I'm drawing, but I'm doing all those things that nurses are doing. But um, I think some of the theme that's coming out in our podcast here is that it is a journey and it's, and it's your journey. So, you know, it's our journey. We all, we own it. You own it and you learning what you like and what you don't like and what you're willing to do and not willing to do. Those are really big, important things and, and accepting them and accepting and saying, this is, this is what I like and this is what works for me. And it, like what you're saying, Colleen, and a journey takes time. Like it's not overnight, right? It's step by step. It's, and you know, even Christina with your experience and feeling like, oh, you know, you wish you had waited, 
you know, to, to get into the position that you would have liked, but like you, you also kind of, you know, hinted on like, how do you know, like if that had been your first job, that it would have been completely and entirely overwhelming. And then you would have been like, you know what, I don't really like this. I think, you know, you kind of approach nursing, like no regrets. Like I've had jobs that I was miserable at and I look back on it and I'm like, but there's so much I learned from it. And there's so much I can take away that I, I bring with me, I hold with me and I take it to my next position, to my next area that I wouldn't have had if I had not done that. So like, you know, no regrets, you know, you, you go through it. And I think the key thing is, um, you know, in, in that journey is that you're not afraid to move forward and to like, to not settle. I think that's the biggest thing for me is not settling. Like if you're not happy, you don't have to stay at a place for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I've met 30 year veteran nurses in one position that are absolutely miserable at what they're doing. And it's like, why are you still here? You know, there's some element of fear or hesitation, or the unknown, but I think you have to kind of definitely, uh, you know, just, you know, break down those walls of fear to kind of exp- like what I'm doing, I feel like was a big, huge step of, of that because I wasn't happy where I was. I wasn't happy with what I was doing there and I didn't want to continue in it. And, um, you know, it's a matter of just, just saying, you know, I'm not going to settle. I'm going to continue and move forward. I take the, the knowledge I've learned. I take the friendships, the relationships, the networks that I've, I've, you know, I've people I've met along the way. I take that with me and I move forward until you find, you know, the place where you belong. So, and I think it's important to be happy. I think it, it can coexist, you know, working and being happy with what you do. You know, I love that's such an encouragement, Christina, that you're saying like, you love going to work every day. Like, so few people dread waking up in the morning. I've been there, you know, to go to a job they don't like that they're not happy with. So, I mean, that's an encouragement to just, you know, we, we can have that and why not, you know, for your mental health, you know, and your sanity, why be at a place that you're miserable at? So I, I do firmly believe in, you know, finding a place that you feel you belong and that you're happy with. And I mean, it's hard work. We're not afraid of hard work, everything, you know, there's challenges and everything, but, you know, ultimately at your core, you have to kind of know, like, this is where I belong. Exactly. And like, I remember, you know, being in school and, and there was a nurse practitioner that I was friends with on Facebook and I felt like she had a new job, a new nurse practitioner job every, like, a few months. And I was like, I know. what is wrong? Like, I, I don't understand. About. You know who I'm talking about. I was like, I don't, yes. like, what is happening? But like... I get it now. Like, I get it. Like, you have to advocate for yourself. If you're not in the right position, girl, move on. Boy, move on. Whatever. Like, like do, like, stand up for yourself and find what's right for you. And don't be afraid because there are so many positions out there. And if it takes, you know, 20 different positions, to keep going until you find the right one. Do not be afraid. Yeah, it's good. This is general good advice. Yes. And with that being said, Christina, what you said, like, I agree with Alicia, like it is a journey and you didn't, I mean, okay, you can say now that was a mistake working there, but you learned, you still learned a lot from that experience, right? No matter what the experience is, good or bad, there's still takeaways from it. And that's important too. And you probably did. You got, it allowed you to acclimate to your role as an NP. So now that in your, the job that you really enjoy doing you're so much more comfortable because of those experiences right exactly exactly and you know so don't be afraid don't be afraid you know what and you know what i learned to stand up for myself i learned to you know what to accept from my provider what not to accept from my collaborating physician and um you know i, I learned a lot i learned a lot about the subject and i and i don't regret any of my choices um because i i am where i am and and i believe that everything happens for a reason amen yep. so to all you listeners don't be afraid to take the leap right no matter what take it because you never know um what the experiences you'll gain right and and where it'll take you so so Go for it, no matter what. Yeah, and, and, and advocate for yourself. Stand up for yourself. Just like you would for your patients. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for listening. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to us and give us five stars. If you have any ideas or comments, please message us at 4 Podcast at gmail.com. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 4NPs Podcast. That's the number 4NPS Podcast. For more information and other career opportunities that you can have as an NP, including an advisor for a tech startup, 
or a legal NP consultant, please click on the link in our show notes. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast and go to our website at 4NPspodcast.com for episode transcripts, resources, and more information about us. We thank you for joining us and we hope you'll listen to our next episode. So you got the job. Now what? The information in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be used in substitute for professional care by a medical provider. The information in this podcast does not represent medical or other professional advice or services. The thoughts and opinions presented on the 4NPs podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent those of their employers.